Welcome, everybody. My name is Seth Bongartz, and I'm the president of Hildeen. Actually, before we start, Stephanie reminded me to ask people to turn off their cell phones. So we'll do that first. Um, <clears throat> so tonight, we welcome two old friends of Hildeen, Harold Holzer and Craig Simons. Harold Holzer, on the right, well, depending on where you are, actually, on your <laughs> left, um, <clears throat> has spoken here, be it at symposia or with regard to his books, at least a dozen times? Mm -hmm. A dozen times. He's the author of two of my favorite Lincoln books, Lincoln at Cooper Union, The Speech That Made Abraham Lincoln President, and Lincoln President-Elect, Abraham Lincoln and the Great Secession War, 1860 to 1861. I'm, I'm sorry, Secession Winter. Greg Simons <clears throat> taught history at the Naval Academy from 1975 until his retirement in 2005. He has uh, spoken previ previously at uh, Hildeen. He's the author of two books, or more than two, but two that, two that I know about in particular, Lincoln and His Admirals, the book about which he spoke when he came here, and recently, Neptune, The Allied Invasion of Europe and the D-Day Landings. I have read the first and have the second in the pile by the side of my bed. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> but tonight's session is not exactly about history. Um, it is instead focused on character and values. Abraham Lincoln and Franklin Roosevelt are America's two great wartime presidents. Both were larger than life figures, deeply involved in every aspect of the war they oversaw, and both had remarkably comprehensive visions of what the war was about and the opportunity inherent in the aftermath. While very different people, Lincoln and Roosevelt both had a strong value system rooted in their understanding of right versus wrong within the context of the American ideal. <clears throat> that understanding brilliant, brilliantly informed the way they utilized the wars they oversaw to shape a better world going forward. Tonight, Mr. Holzer and Mr. Simons will compare and contrast the character and value systems of these two giants, and in doing so, will position us to think about the fact that character and values are timeless and just as relevant today as they were 150 and 75 years ago, respectively. So while Hildeen is rooted in history, it is fundamentally about the future. While most Lincoln sites focus on Lincoln as the historical giant he was, our path is slightly different as we focus on carrying Lincoln values into the 21st century and beyond. Our mission, values into action, and our core values of integrity, perseverance, and civic responsibility all emanate directly from Lincoln. But they are now our own, and we utilize them to engage those we reach in a quest for a higher ideal, just as did Lincoln and Roosevelt. So sit back and enjoy the discussion. I think you're going to speak for 40, 40, 45 minutes and then questions. And we'll have time for questions at the end, so I'll be up for that part of the uh, event. Um, and we will have uh, plenty of time for questions. And by the way, bathrooms around the corner. OK, thanks. Thank you, Seth. Can you all hear? Good. It's uh, wonderful for me to be back at Hildeen. As Seth says, it's uh, really a, a return visit to one of our favorite places in the world. Um, I guess I'll keep talking until we get it right so we don't have any feedbacks. Um, the last time I spoke here um, in this tent, it was to the New York State Cemetery Association, <laughs> which, as I was telling uh, Seth, was a very jolly group. It turned out to be, <laughs> so you have a lot to live up to, no pun intended. And anytime I can come to Hildeen and look out and see Nate Boone and Mrs. Boone, the day is made for me. It's great to see him, as always. Um, let me explain how we propose to do our conversation uh, to, tonight, because Craig and I both write about both Abraham Lincoln and Franklin Roosevelt. Um, Craig, as you may know, won the Lincoln Prize for Lincoln and his admirals. He's also won the Franklin and Theodore Roosevelt Prize for Naval History, and he writes mostly about World War II now unless I can drag him back into the field that he should be focusing on. Um, he, he taught for 30 years at the Naval Academy, and he's uh, going to be coming back to Newport to teach uh, for a couple of years, uh, it, starting in the next semester. 
I, on the other hand, have written exclusively about Lincoln, but in my new life, I'm the director of the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute, which in a way is somewhat like Hildeen. It's a historic place. It was uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt's New York City home from 1908 until he left for the presidency. His mother bought it for Eleanor and Franklin as a wedding present, and it is an institute devoted to not only to history but to current values and uh, concerns in public affairs, public policy, and human rights. It was also the uh, transition headquarters for FDR between Election Day 32 and right before the inauguration in 1933. So we like to say that it was, it's the Trump Tower of 1932. <laughs> Okay, that's it for my jokes. Um, how are we going to handle the discussion today? So we thought the best way to handle it would be, I'll pose the questions, and I'll offer a brief Lincoln retort to my own query, and then I'll ask Craig to comment on Lincoln and then to initiate the Roosevelt side of the discussion, and then I'll comment if there's anything left on Roosevelt, and we'll keep going uh, that way until we exhaust ourselves and get ready for your questions. So let me start with a good place to start, um, origins and education, preparation for leadership and character. Uh, and the question is, what did each man as a politician, a candidate, and an elected leader bring to the table as they faced the existential crises that roiled their administrations? Um, with Lincoln, I would suggest clearly that when he described his own education uh, on a House of Representatives questionnaire as defective, <laughs> that was all he wrote. You know, they had a line that said education, you're supposed to fill in your prep school and your college. So he wrote education defective. Um, there was just an astonishing absence of formal training of any kind. Uh, less than a year of schooling altogether, somewhat ri more rigorous than people realize when there was an itinerant teacher in the vicinity or in the neighborhood, as Lincoln later wrote in his autobiographical sketch before the 1860 campaign. Uh, but again, he had some mentors along the way. He had a stepmother who fortunately brought reading material into their home when Lincoln's father remarried. Other than that, it's a, an extraordinary mystery to me. And Craig, you take it with Lincoln and then bring us into FDR. Yeah, there's often a lot of talk about preparation for the presidency. What preparation is appropriate for someone who would put himself forward to be chief executive of the United States? And most people know about Lincoln that in terms of a resume, his was pretty thin as a presidential candidate in 1860. He served one term in the House of Representatives. He could have been reelected, clearly, but there had been an arrangement conducted among three of the leading Whigs in Illinois, and they were going to take turns with one another. And when Lincoln's two years were up, he sort of stepped aside and allowed his successor to take that over. But that was the extent of his government experience, other than some state offices that he held earlier in life. Um, and some have argued, well, what that suggests is that in terms of training in to be a government, you don't really need to be in government. I'm not sure that's true. Uh, I think the reason Lincoln was so successful as a president was less his experience than his temperament, and we can talk more about that later. Uh, temperament is a key, I think, to appreciating greatness in a lot of venues, but particularly in terms of politics and the presidency. Now, Roosevelt contrasts dramatically to that. I mean, if you look at the list of presidents, and I know Harold is going to visit the whole idea of ranking presidents in terms of various characteristics, but if you look at them as a group, you've got many former governors, a handful of former senators, quite a few generals, actually, beginning with the first, General Washington, and all the way up to famously General Eisenhower. Uh, Lincoln was none of these. He was not a general, obviously. He used to joke about his military experience as a squad leader in the Black Hawk War. He was not a governor. He was not a senator, though he tried twice. Um, but Roosevelt did have that resume. And in fact, I think Roosevelt almost modeled his political resume after his 
sixth cousin once removed Theodore Roosevelt. He was a, a legislator in New York. He was a assistant secretary of the Navy, a governor of New York. I mean, he compiled a resume that was not only appropriate for, a, as we have thought of it, traditionally for a presidential candidate, but one that was very, very similar to uh, cousin Ted. So in that respect, they're, they're different in terms of preparation, but where they are similar, I think, is again that curious word temperament. One, one story about Lincoln, I think he was always somewhat embarrassed about his, his want of education, as FDR mm -hmm. was incredibly proud of his Harvard pedigree, um, very much a part of the clubs and the organizations there although allegedly not a great favorite of his fellow students because he seemed to be skimming by in some, in some respects. But when, when Lincoln arrived at one of the Lincoln-Douglas debates at uh, Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois, the speaker stand had been set up against the wall of the school because of the howling wind in October. Lincoln was told he had to go through the front door, walk up the steps, and then step out the window, and as he, as he put his long legs through the window to mount the platform, he turned and said, well, at last I can say that I've been through college. <laughs> so I think he, he cared. I've never heard that story before. Really? That's great, yeah. I've told it. I thought I told you. You weren't listening. I wasn't listening. <laughs> if, you, if you had looked at the two presidents of America in 1861, and calculated who is going to be the greater leader, who is going to have more sensitivity, who is going to have better rapport with the military. Abraham Lincoln with his one term in Congress and two failed senatorial bids, or Jefferson Davis, who had been Secretary of War, uh, active military man in Mexico. Senator. US Senator. What would you have chosen? I mean, you've chosen Davis. And in a way, I think that's true, and, and Lincoln also compares favorably in terms of his tremendous success as president with his predecessor. And the same argument can be made. James Buchanan is routinely ranked at the very bottom of the list of American presidents, and he had a resume that would uh, impress anyone. I mean, yep. ambassador, senator, governor, congressman, he, he'd done it all, but he was a terrible president. Yeah, so it is that intangible something which we yeah. will return to. So. Both Lincoln and Roosevelt faced different crises, but in common, as a test of leadership, both faced, I guess, so somewhat surprising slash surprise attacks mm. from hostile forces at military bases that belonged to the United States. Lincoln in Charleston, South Carolina, when Fort Sumter was attacked, and Roosevelt, of course, at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii when that base was attacked by the Japanese in, in December um, 1941. And both men have been accused through the years of knowing about, tolerating, planning, hoping to take advantage of those attacks. Is that just too Machiavellian? I mean, Lincoln, I, I think, is probably a little more culpable in that he decided and announced that he was going to resupply but not rearm Fort Sumter and perhaps anticipated some hostile reaction. Uh, his Secretary of State wanted him very much to focus on the forts in remote Florida, but Lincoln thought, as he often did when he put his foot down, the tug had to come in Charleston. Um, Craig, what do you think? And then take us to Pearl. Well, I think that Lincoln knew he was putting uh, Southern decision makers, among them Jefferson Davis, of course, in a very difficult position and doing it quite deliberately. But I also think it was a matter of principle to him. Here was a fort of the United States government built on an island, an artificial man-made island that had been built by the Army Corps of Engineers based on granite that had been hauled there from Massachusetts. I mean, this is not, I'm going to take a South Carolina fort. This was a United States fort manned by United States personnel, and all he wanted to do, he wasn't going to attack anybody. He simply said, we're going to keep it. And if you don't like that circumstance, the ball's in your court. Now, that was a situation where he, he could not really lose. He, he, he was accused, of course, of being a provocateur, 
but any reasonable person looking at that would see who actually did fire the first shot. And so reluctant was Robert Anderson, who commanded the garrison in that fort, that he just took it for 12 hours before he ever fired a shot back again to make absolutely sure everyone knew who fired that first shot. Now, there's a certain Machiavellianness to that. There's a certain cleverness about that. And one thing we must never forget about these two men is they are politicians as well as statesmen. They make decisions based on careful calculation. But I think at root also, Lincoln said this is American territory. This is all part of the United States. I do not accept secession as a legitimate constitutional alternative to losing an election, and I'm keeping it. Now, Roosevelt and Pearl Harbor is, is a somewhat different situation. Roosevelt did see placing the United States fleet in Pearl Harbor as a political move, move, but it was a political move aimed at the Japanese. The Japanese had moved into Indochina, they were fighting a war in China, they had taken over Manchuria, they had eyes on Burma, uh, and what was then called Siam, now Thailand, and in order to, to discourage the Japanese from these aggressive moves southward, Roosevelt assumed that having the United States fleet in Pearl Harbor, roughly halfway across the Pacific, would act as a deterrent on the Japanese. Uh, now his critics, both at the time and later, said, oh no, he put them out there as a sacrificial lamb, hoping to draw Japanese attention because he was eager to get into the war against Hitler, and this would be the famous phrase, the back door to war. Uh, I discount that entirely. Uh, so in each case, I think there were political slash diplomatic, if you would, motivations behind the decisions made by each chief executive, but I don't think either one of them was cynical. I think now We can get into that in yeah, the questions later if you want. But. I think Lincoln benefited enormously from something he couldn't have predicted, which is that, A, it was a casualty-free bombardment. Yeah. One, the only person who died, died in somewhat different circumstances than Well, excuse me, Friend Robert, but they were saluting the flag. Right. They said, well, <laughs> you know, all right, I'll surrender, but you have to let me lower the flag and fire a salute to it. They said, well, okay, you can do that. So they're firing this salute as the flag comes down, and the gun blows up yeah. and kills the guy manning the gun. First <laughs> death in the Civil War. So, the, and, and speaking of the flag, because the flag was shot down twice, and then it was reported in some northern newspapers, dragged through the mud before it was returned to Major Anderson, newspapers in the North, both pro-democratic and pro-republican, were filled with reports of this insult to the symbol of America, to the symbol of the revolution. And what happened next can only be described under one of the headlines in these newspapers, flag mania. No one saw anything like it in New York until 9-11. Every building was adorned with a flag. Every lapel was adorned with red, white, and blue lapel piece. Not the kind we have today, but ribbons. And um, it exhilarated and galvanized the nation. Yeah. I mean, as did Pearl Harbor. As did Pearl Harbor. But let me ask you about, just about the Pearl Harbor circumstance. Was there any immediate pushback on lack of preparedness? Because Pearl Harbor is a casualty riven field. Absolutely there was, and continues to be, by yeah. the way. This is still a controversy. Uh, uh, Admiral Husband Kimmel was the commander of the fleet uh, that was devastated that day, and uh, Lieutenant General Walter Short was the commander of the base. Now technically the base commander, it's the, um, you'd expect a Navy guy to say this, right? It's the Army's fault, see? <laughs> the Army is supposed to guard the base, and the fleet is supposed to be prepared for offensive activity. Uh, but Kimmel, in particular, came under uh, horrible scrutiny. Both were fired, both were cashiered. Um, Kimmel's descendants continue to this day to fight f to get uh, their ancestor restored to four-star rank. Uh, the commander of the Pacific Fleet automatically carries a four-star rank. His, his statutory rank was two-star rear admiral, and he, and he was retired out of the service, not at his request under that rank. Interestingly, at the Naval Academy, where I taught for so long, uh, he is buried, and his tomb has four stars on it. So the family made sure they got that. But the argument still continues. To what extent were they culpable? Were they unprepared? Were they unready? And there's a long backstory to that, and I'll give the shortest version as I can. 
um, that because we were reading portions of the Japanese diplomatic code, not the operational code, but the diplomatic code, we did know that something was coming, that the Japanese were about to break diplomatic relations. We didn't know what they were going to do or where, but they knew they were going to do something. And so a war warning was sent out on November 27th to all Pacific commands that read, war may begin at any moment. You should be completely prepared. And of course, two weeks later, they weren't. So there is that argument. Um, but on the other hand, what was expected was an attack on the Philippines. That's where the danger was. No one, absolutely no one, anticipated that the Japanese would be able to get a six-carrier task force 4,000 miles from Japan across the Pacific without being noticed, recognized, or identified and strike Pearl Harbor. So it really was a bolt from the blue for everyone. And one of the marks of leadership, or the tests, I should say, of leadership, is how a leader responds to the exigencies that are beyond that of, of, over which he has no real immediate control. We know that Lincoln um, called for 75,000 volunteers, but that immediately propelled three or four more states out of the Union, lost Virginia, lost um, North Carolina. Tennessee, yeah. Tennessee. Um, FDR had to decide whether to declare war on Japan or Japan and Germany. Yeah. He was presented a ridiculous manuscript by Cordell Hull, which I've seen at Hyde Park, which was 30 or 40 pages, who Hull told him, this is the speech you should make. And Roosevelt decided that this was the day that which will live in infamy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And decided, I mean, how, how do we measure leadership according to that kind of response? It's the, the ultimate test, isn't it? It is, and I think it's, it speaks volumes that the two men did not give hour, hour and a half long speeches. They knew what the moment called for. It called for that incisive statement about the day that will date, actually, that will live in infamy. Which will live. Is which he will changed live it to infamy. which. I don't yeah, know why. I don't know why it's either. Not grammatical. Uh, he needs an editor. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but I think, again, that speaks to their uh, political savvy uh, almost as much or even more than their statesmanship. But you mentioned declaration of war for Roosevelt. And, and the key question here is on whom? I mean, Japan attacked us. That's easy. But Japan and Germany were allied in this pact of steel, as they called it. Technically, now, it doesn't mean that we're at war with Germany when Japan attacks the United States, because that pact said that each nation, that is Japan and Germany, would come to the aid of the other if attacked. Didn't say that if you attack somebody else, I'll help you. So Germany said nothing. And Roosevelt said, well, I can't really declare war on Germany just because Japan attacked the United States. I mean, he did believe existentially that Germany was a genuine foe and had to be defeated in a way you could say he wanted to go to war with Germany, but he also knew that politically he might not be able to get it. People might say, well, why are we going to war with Germany? They, they, Germany didn't attack us. So that declaration of war on the 8th of December was against Japan only. And for three days, we fought Japan only. And then Hitler declared war on the United States. You can almost imagine Roosevelt going, you know, got it. You mentioned how each, how each knew not to make long, long, long speeches. Roosevelt is talking to Congress and also the radio audiences, ultimately the, uh, the movie newsreel audiences. Lincoln didn't make any public speeches. In fact, he, he did not send his congressional message uh, for May, June, almost three months. Right. So that brings us to the, the big question of communications. I mean, we both appeared at forums together where we talk about the fact that great leaders have to be great communicators, have to know the technology of the times, the audience, and be on the cutting edge of the technology. For Lincoln, um, it was um, daring to give remarks where presidents often did not. Lincoln rose to power at a time when presidential candidates didn't campaign publicly for office. No appearances, no debates, no tours, although Stephen Douglas, his opponent, did make a railroad tour and was mocked mercilessly for doing it. Um, and he was generally quite silent as president. 
Um, the Gettysburg Address and the inaugurals are exceptions to the rule of presidential silence. What he did was issue messages in the form of letters to people that he's had published in the newspapers. Um, that was revolutionary. And you can. And very clever. And I think. Very clever. I mean, in a way, he wanted to communicate, reach out beyond to the people, to the electorate, to the voters, to the citizens. And how do you do that? And in a way, he invented this idea. Well, I'll write a letter putatively to some friend or colleague or political person, but I'll make sure or that that editor. letter, yeah. or an editor, right. but I'll make sure that letter gets published. And I mean, there were no press releases. There were no presidential press conferences. So this was about the only way he, he could do that. Who wants to go back to that? Well, we can't. We can't really. <laughs> Have a go on that. Now, he, of course, he was so. Go ahead. Canny about this, that one, his most famous letter to the editor, to New York Tribune editor Horace Greeley on the subject of emancipation, he was so irked by Greeley that he sent the letter, but then he brought a handwritten copy to a Washington newspaper and had it published on a Saturday, knowing Greeley didn't publish on Sundays and would have to wait until Monday. So he was master of, and of course FDR, Sublime. the sublime. Uh, yeah. communicated with the voice made for that moment. Well, FDR had something Lincoln did not have, and that's radio. Yeah. Uh, and if Lincoln mastered the ability to reach out by using letters, Roosevelt was really the first to reach out directly to the people with fireside chats. I mean, it was brilliant. Um, he, he was uh, conversational. He was friendly. You'd listen to that and think he was just talking to you. And, and how revolutionary was this? Because previous to that, if you ever saw a president or heard a president speak, it was either from a great distance and a live audience, or, or perhaps there was a recording, scratchy and very stultifying, uh, on movie tone news or something like that. But a fireside chat where you'd gather around that old radio set uh, with tubes in it and so forth, uh, and just listen to this man talk to you. Uh, he, th that was absolutely brilliant. And, and just to hammer that home and to make a Roosevelt-Lincoln connection, the existing newsreels of the dedication of the Lincoln Memorial in the 20s with Warren Harding speaking, you see Harding going like this as he speaks to gesture to a large crowd. There's no amplification, and it's a silent movie. Yeah. <laughs> There's only 10 years between that moment and yeah. Roosevelt's ascent. Yeah. So I... I um, I work at Roosevelt House, as I mentioned, and two floors below me uh, is a parlor, and it's the parlor where FDR delivered a radio address a couple of days after his election from in front of the fireplace yeah. uh, with his mother and his wife and a couple of his children in the room. I believe it doesn't count as a fireside chat, uh, but it was a fireside chat, and I think it set the tone and gave him the idea. And if you talk to people who lived through that period, um, they th and, and you ask them, how many fireside chats do you think Roosevelt gave? They say, a hundred? No, it's like a handful. Yeah. But they were so powerful and memorable yeah. that people remember them always. And by the way, that first radio address from Roosevelt House was considered by some to be quite improper and scandalous. Yeah. It was yeah. akin to tweeting. Presidents didn't go on the radio to talk to people. It just wasn't. Well, I was going to follow up on that. If we've got Lincoln and the letters, and we've got Roosevelt and the radio, John Kennedy and the television, and now we've got tweeting. Right. So. But President Obama was also um, a used social media. Yes, as known that's before. true. And now we have, but he didn't communicate as directly and as frequently as yeah. President Trump does. So that is a in the line of mastering new technologies, without question. Lincoln did something else. I didn't even write about this in my, in my book about Lincoln and the press, which I regret. In the last few weeks of the war, Lincoln was at the front for most of that period, visiting General Grant and the Army of the Potomac. And he sent a series of letters, tele wires, this is important, I shouldn't have said letters, to Secretary of War that were then published in the newspapers. Mm -hmm. Through that device, Lincoln bypassed the press, the Secretary of War. He became his own Ernie Pyle. He was yeah. reporting from the front. He was practically a newspaper man. Yeah. And yeah. that's, again, another, yeah. another novel thing. Let's talk about the press. Um, Lincoln 
lived in an era of partisan newspapers, openly partisan newspapers. Democratic papers were proud to say they were so. Republican papers equally proud to carry. Did I say Republican twice? Republican and Democratic. No, you didn't. Know. Okay. Um, and their coverage was totally, openly, celebratorily biased. That changed. Fox and MSNBC. It was like Fox. But well, but Fox and MSNBC both say that they're the I know. genuine, That's true. straight arrow news. That's news. true. And they, these guys did not. These guys were Just. admitted that they were, and often their names were Democrat or Republican yeah. um, to, to drive that home. Um, FDR created the press conference, did he not? That was his. FDR. And again, it's the same, back to the temperament question. It's the same kind of thing that uh, he developed on the radio with the general audiences. He developed with the press in the White House. Now, of course, he was physically immobile. We all know that now. Believe it or not, you'd be amazed at the percentage of American citizens who did not know during the Roosevelt presidency that he had legs that did not work. Could, they would not film him. They would not show him with his braces or in a wheelchair, just by general consent. It was, it was rude. It was impolite. They just wouldn't do that. And in the same spirit, uh, because he was sort of affixed to his desk, the press would come to him. He didn't go down to the press room. The press came into his office. And they would gather in a circle, and a few would be seated, and many would be standing, and they'd be holding their pads and pencils. Pads and pencils, remember those? <laughs> and, uh, and he would just start chatting with it. Well, boys, he would say, I got a few things for you today. And he'd lead off. And they would ask questions. And he'd say, well, this is not, this is just between us. And then he'd tell them something. And nobody would print it because he said, this is not for general distribution. Can you imagine that <laughs> happening today? Um, but they, and he made them laugh. And they made him laugh. And they'd kid back and forth. And then he'd say, oh, you know, wait a minute, that thing I told you before, don't print that either. Right. And they wouldn't. And, and so that kind of relationship, they, they were almost his acolytes. I mean, they were, you know, fans. Now, those he did frequently. That was once a week for 12 years. Yeah, he did all the time. Years. Yeah, yeah. And those of you who remember the movie uh, Yankee Doodle Dandy will remember James Cagney as George M. Cohan as FDR in I don't know what the, the musical was. They were excerpting, I'd rather be president or something. And he says, gentlemen, this is off the record. Yeah. That's my Cagney imitating Roosevelt. <laughs> um, um, and he said, off the record. Yeah. But and it was. But let's also talk about the limits to his generosity. All men, as you said, he said, boys. All men, boys. All whites. Mm -hmm. There was a uh, uh, Chicago Defender, I think is the name of the paper, was very annoyed and loudly so, an appeal to Eleanor Roosevelt about being excluded from the press conferences on the, on the basis of race. There were white reporters who would go out and feed the Defender yeah. reporter who was outside right. the gates of the White right. House. Right. So, you know, it's with, generous but within well, constraints. Well, let me follow up on that. Just probably I'm anticipating a question I assume you're going to ask in the future, but let's jump on it now. And that is that Roosevelt dealt with a Congress that for the first 100 days was famously kind of a pet Congress. It was very heavily Democratic. The Democrats dominated both houses of the Congress, and he got a lot of things done. But a big percentage of that Democratic majority were sometimes called bowl weevil Democrats, the Southern Democrats, what we would consider socially conservative Democrats today, all of whom today are Republicans. And if Roosevelt pushed too hard on questions of race, He'd lose them, and then he wouldn't get, you know, lend lease. Then he wouldn't get Social Security. Then he wouldn't get. And Eleanor, as you well know, was always after him, you know, to push harder. And he'd say, Eleanor, I Babs, Babs, I can only do so much because I got to get these mm -hmm. other things. That was his argument. That was his argument. That was his argument. You're Whether, not buying it. Well, I think in the New Deal programs, he would have gotten them passed because they were social conservatives, but in terms of government spending and initiatives, they were, at that point, as progressive as anybody, the Bull Weevils, the Dixiecrats. What I think he was careful about is making sure that programs were race blind. He wouldn't do that. Yeah. He restricted housing things and labor laws, and he, that's how, that, that was the, the, the deal he got for not um, yeah. filibustering these bills. Yeah. So 
Yeah, it's a mix. It's I, you a know, mix and I think if we're going to go back to Lincoln as well, if I can tie this back in, you know, Lincoln and emancipation is a big question. We could spend several hours on that one. And there are those today who criticize Lincoln for being too slow. You know, he, he didn't act right away. He waited a long time. And then even when it, he did, he said, no, well, it's only emancipation for those who are living in areas occupied by the Confederates so that those in areas where we have control, you guys are still slaves. What's the matter with this guy? Why doesn't he just do what's right? Because he could only do what was possible. And in the same way, every politician has to say, I can only do what's possible. I know what's right. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go in that direction as far as I can go until reality tells me I can't go any further than that. And I'll have to hope for a change. Well, here's an interesting story about Lincoln. By the way, Lincoln had one known interaction with an African-American journalist, Frederick Douglass. Yeah. When he welcomed Frederick Douglass to the White House, Douglass was still publishing his newspaper out of Rochester, New York, which was unbelievably critical of Lincoln, called him a slave catcher, underground railroad man, and Douglas came to advocate for equal pay for African American troops in this, in the, on the Union side of the Civil War. And Lincoln said, well, you know, we'll get there, we'll recruit, we'll, but you know, you should be the recruiter. You should be the chief recruiter. You want to give up your newspaper. So effectively, Lincoln drove him out of the newspaper sure. business. Yeah. Um, here's another Lincoln story and it relates to emancipation. So Lincoln was extremely anxious, as you say, about losing the fragile hold he had on white voters in the North. He only won 50% of the white voters in the North. Um, and there were uh, only white voters in the North, uh, for the most 50 part. 50% of the of voters in the North. You're, thank you for correcting me. There were some African Americans. Yeah, Massachusetts many. allowed some yeah. to vote. Yeah. Um, so, he, extremely nervous about the impact of the emancipation on the con off year elections. We're already talking about 2018 in this country. They were certainly talking about the con upcoming congressional elections in November of 62 when Lincoln was weighing a proclamation in August of 62. So he invites a delegation of free African Americans to the White House and he tells them, I'm not doing, you know, I'm not interested in doing this. You should go back to Africa. We should do colonization. Then he writes a letter to Horace Greeley and says, I'm not necessarily going to be an, uh, emancipate the slaves in all places. What I do, I do to preserve the Union. And then worst of all, he welcomes Chicago ministers to the White House a few days before the proclamation actually goes. And remember, he's written it already. Yeah. He knows he's going to issue it. He's waiting for a Union battlefield victory on whose coattails he can, he can issue it without being accused of desperation. And he tells these Chicago ministers, what good would a proclamation for me do? It would be like the Pope's bull against the comet. One of the ancient popes had issued a decree saying, Halley's comet shall not come. And the next day they were all ducking for cover because it was coming. Um, he didn't want to be seen as ridiculous. So the Chicago people go back home and they write a letter, a, a, an article about their uh, meeting with Lincoln in which they tell their readers, well, there's not going to be a proclamation. The right. president said so. That article is published on the same day as the Chicago Papers report the Emancipation Party. Right. Do you know what we would call that today? There would be a two-word phrase, what that is. That's it, fake news. Lincoln was a master at fake news before there was fake news. So changing pace, um, and clearly, mastery of communications is yeah. an essential of leadership at any time in this country. How were each men at managing subordinates? You, you go, because I'm tired of talking. <laughs> <laughs> How were each man at, in that well, social too, is it not? And in, do, in, let's do civilian and military yeah, for both guys. And I think in this way, there's a lot, they have a lot in common. And it, it goes back perhaps to that temperament. They, they could read people really well, uh, I think. And one of the things that each man did was a visitor would come. Now, of course, in Lincoln's time, you could just walk into the White House. I mean, pretty much come knock on the door and say, I'm, I want to talk to the president. And unless you were you know, armed or a raving, you, you probably had a pretty good chance of getting in to see him. So Lincoln had to deal with all these people, many of whom wanted jobs. Uh, and he'd listen and be polite. And he, you know, if he could do something for me, he might write a little note and say, you know, if you can do something for this man, help him out. And a lot of those are in the archives. Harold's read every one of them. Um, <laughs> But if he couldn't or he didn't, he'd often say, well, you know what? That reminds me of a story. 
And he'd tell a little story about a farmer or whatever, and ah, ha, ah, ah, ha, and they'd slap, and he'd stand up, and so the other guy would stand up, and they'd walk to the door, and he'd shake his hand, the guy would go down the hall and say, wait a minute, what just happened here? Right? <laughs> and Roosevelt could do that too. Roosevelt never liked to say no to anyone. He really wouldn't look you in the eye and say, no, that's wrong, I disagree, and let me tell you why, or no, you can't have what you want. He'd say, that's great, Sam. I'm you're right. That, I'm going to look into that right away. And then, you know, he'd take him to shake his hand, close it, and he said, never let that guy in here again. <laughs> uh, so each of them could confront a petitioner with bonhomie, with humor, uh, and so forth, um, even when the answer had to be no for political reasons. They so, clearly did not like to say no. They didn't, neither one. I don't think Roosevelt ever said ever no. Ever said no. To anyone. Yeah, yeah. that's right. I, I, I'm sure that's right. And it got him into trouble because he'd say yes to this guy and then yes to that right. guy, and they were absolutely. And, and then, then those two guys would he'd get say, together. Work it out. Work it out. Yeah, yeah. You didn't want to be it out. Work it out. You know, two floors below my office again, in at Roosevelt House, Francis Perkins arrived in uh, December 1932, knowing that FDR was going to appoint her Secretary of Labor. She had served in that role in his gubernatorial administration. And he said, predicted, Francis, I want to make you the first woman ever to serve in a presidential cabinet. She didn't That's his Roosevelt, too, by that the way. Was, that was without Cagney. Without Cagney. I'm sure they got it. Um, <laughs> she wasn't sure she wanted to do it. She had a husband who was in care in New York. So she said, Governor, only if you do um, uh, workman, uh, senior, whatever you call it. Uh, she didn't say Social Security. I've ruined my story. Only if you do a program for the elderly, as we've done in New York, as we've started to do. And he said, yes. So she became Secretary of Labor, and that's where Social Security was born. Thank you, Francis. Right two floors below my office. But what about, and of course you write about Lincoln and his, and I think what, Lincoln used his size to advantage with ushering those people out of the office. <laughs> because he was a big, he was a big man. Roosevelt had to do it through charm. Yeah. He wasn't yeah. doing it through physicality, although he was in physical. In yeah. His well, he had been a robust young man. Very uh, much so. and, and, and he had that self-confidence. And there's something about confidence. And that, besides temperament, confidence is another thing you have to have. I imagine most people who run for president are probably have a healthy enough <laughs> ego. But self-confidence convinces other people that you have something, even when you don't. Yeah. And, and he, that that charmed childhood, whether he, got, he was a C-minus student at Harvard, but he was at Harvard and he was in all the right clubs and all of this business, and, and he had been handsome and tall and athletic and successful, and, and he retained all that in, through those many years when he was none of those things. And in terms of managing FDR's cabinet, Lincoln's cabinet, mm. uh, FDR's military a, a, a team, and Lincoln's. I mean, you can say that Lincoln did pretty well with his cabinet. He had at least one yeah. member of it who was openly uh, craven and wanted to be his successor as president. In those days, cabinets were picked exclusively geographically, right. not by gender, not by race, not from Goldman Sachs. They were all from, <laughs> from different areas yeah. of the country. No, I true. have to satisfy Indiana, Ohio, right. Pennsylvania. That's what a balanced cabinet That was a balanced them. cabinet, yeah. all, of course, male. And Lincoln did a pretty good job with that. He had less success early in the war with assembling a military team. And uh, I'll punt it to you and ask if you think, if you agree, and whether you think part of that was attributable to the fact that so many southern-born West Point and Annapolis-trained yeah. military people left to fight for their native soil, the Confederacy. I'm not going to buy the argument that having West Point trained personnel on your side is a great <laughs> advantage. I'm just not going to go there. That's Annapolis talking. Okay, okay. No, no more West Point jokes. I'm done with those. But I will say this about, you know, uh, our, our friend uh, uh, Doris uh, Kearns Goodman wrote a book, uh, Lincoln's Team of Rivals. Team of Rivals. And, and that suggests something about the cabinet. He had not only geographical distribution, he had Democratic and Republican distribution. He tried to get Southerners in his cabinet. Of course, most of those said, we're not even in your country anymore. How can I be in your cabinet? So, but he tried, seriously tried to do that. And, uh, and Roosevelt did much the same thing. Most people don't appreciate that in 1940, 41, 
When war was looming, already raging in Europe and, and looming on the horizon from the United States, that he invited the two members he had just run against in the election, Alf Landon as president and Frank Knox as vice president, it gave them cabinet appointments. He wanted uh, uh, Alf Landon to be Secretary of Commerce and Frank Knox to be Secretary of the Navy. Landon wouldn't do it. He said, I'll only do it if you'll sign a written pledge that you won't run for a third term. <laughs> eh, I'm not going to do that. So uh, Landon, but Frank Knox was Secretary of the Navy through much of World War II until he died in 1944. And they were, they were uh, rabid Republicans. So we, I think the idea of bringing the enemy into the tent, if you would, uh, was something that both men try, seriously tried to do and then tried to work together with them to create something that would function. And, and both men could do that in part because of the national crisis. Right. We are all Americans now. After Fort Sumter, after Pearl Harbor, come on, we're on the same side here. And Lincoln did technically have one southern or one border state, or two yeah. border states. Two. Uh, Montgomery Blair of Maryland Blair. and Edward Bates and of Bates, Missouri. Yeah. He tried to get a North Carolinian, even a Georgian, but Lincoln certainly had, now Lincoln, as, as Craig has said, had no military experience that he spoke of, except for fighting mosquitoes, as he said in the Black Hawk <laughs> War. Those were his, his enemies. Um, and he had some problems in the beginning. He had a 75-year-old general in chief who had who could barely mount a horse at that point. And he had a young pretender yeah. angling for that job, who yeah. was a little difficult, who was a Democrat. And well, he also, and, and then he, what he did that Roosevelt didn't do, and you should comment on this, is he, to keep unity, he went after Democrats to serve in the military, yes. and he went after ethnic generals. Right. Like Franz right. Sigel. And, uh, I think the reason Lincoln had such difficulty getting uh, successful commanders in 1861 and 1862 uh, was twofold. One is that the war that broke out in 1861 was so different from what anybody then alive imagined. And, and I, I did make fun of West Point, and I'm not going to do that in this. This is a serious statement that at West Point, they studied Napoleon, the greatest commander on the history of the world up to that moment. And Napoleonic tactics dominated many Civil War battlefields in 1861 and 1862. And, Given the advent of the rapid fire, what's called the, the, the mini ball, the rifle that would fire a, a, a muzzle loading bullet up to 10 times as far with accuracy as a smoothbore musket, you, you can't use Napoleonic tactics anymore. Uh, the logistics of, ma of maintaining an army of 150,000 men in the field as opposed to the largest army the United States had ever deployed for battle prior to that, the 10,000 men that Winfield Scott commanded in the Mexican War. And Winfield Scott was still the commander when the war broke out. Uh, so, so the fact that we had to figure out what the heck is this new thing that we're dealing with. Well, you say the South had fewer problems with them. The South was successful in the first couple of years of the war. But remember that in the Civil War, the South's objective was to assert its independence and keep it. They had that the day the war started. They controlled the South. So they had already achieved their objective. The objective of the North was to take that away from them. They had to, to organize a huge army, invade a territory of 600,000 square miles, occupy it, and hold it forever. So the degree of difficulty of those two tasks is, is tremendously disparate. So Lincoln had trouble finding someone who had learned that this was a different kind of war. He finally got him in Grant. But Grant, of course, had struggled through the first two years of the war in the West as well. He was kind of figured it out on the job. And by the time he got the top job in 1864, he was a master of it. Uh, so I, I think it's not that Lincoln couldn't pick good generals, it's that the generals were kind of learning as they went. And by 64, they had it figured out. And you're right, Southerners are defending, which is arguably easier, easier than to do. invading alien territory. As, and the old joke about Robert E. Lee, who was a great general, maybe the most brilliant tactician, not only of that war, but of any American war. But the old joke about him is he couldn't win on the road. Because, <laughs> of course, Antietam, Gettysburg, those didn't work out. Back to your point, it's easier to defend than to attack. Um, uh, by the way, I was positing the, uh, the choice Lincoln's turning to political and ethnic generals early in the war as something that might have 
crimped the style of or the effectiveness of the Union military. I happen to think it was a brilliant and necessary um, um, decision because it yeah. kept people together at a time when the the the, the fracture could have extended. Well, there were a large number of I, both Irish and German immigrants who fought in the Union Army. And one of the jokes is that they were met on the docks, welcome to America, here's your weapon. Um, it wasn't quite that bad, but there were large numbers of both, and each felt, Lincoln certainly felt, that there ought to be some representation of both Irishmen and Germans, if not immigrants, then maybe second generation Irish and German uh, Americans, who were in the general's ranks. And one of the great stories, of course, is that uh, there was a general, uh, he asked, he said, we need a, a German-born general. And so they, the staff people brought him. Here's a list of some German colonels who have been pretty successful. And Lincoln ran his finger down the list and came to Schimmelfennig. And he said, that's the guy. And he said, well, you know, we've got other good, no, no, the name will make up for any deficiencies. <laughs> Sadly, that proved not to be true, but that's another well, story. They, right, in the field, but they were tremendous magnets for recruits. Yes, yes. The ethnic, right. and, and Lincoln had no love, uh, we should be honest about this, Lincoln liked Republicans. Germans were Republicans. Yeah, that's Irishmen true were Democrats. It was 80% each way. Yeah. So he took a risk in yeah. enlisting an Irish corps, or yeah. I don't want to misuse yeah. the military yeah. term, but Irish Soldiers, brigades. brigades, many brigades. So we've talked about decisive communications and most recently decisiveness and working with colleagues and subordinates. I'd like to posit that mercy and forgiveness can be as important in a leader as boldness and toughness. And I think you mentioned FDR is using Frank Knox uh, in terms of extending his reach um, you can say he did the same about Wendell Wilkie during the war. He did not, Hoover wouldn't do anything right away, and that was difficult for Roosevelt. But Lincoln had a forgiving side. What about Roosevelt? Roosevelt was harder to read uh, because Roosevelt kept things close to his chest when he could. Um, he did, as you suggested, invite uh, opposition, uh, meaning uh, Republican, into his administration. He did not, insofar as I've been able to find, and I've looked really hard, take into consideration political tendencies or leanings whatsoever in the appointment and support of uh, commanders in the field, uh, either in the Army or in the Navy or the Marine Corps. Um, that was irrelevant to him. He did love the Navy, uh, by the way. Yeah. His, his experience not only his experience as Assistant Secretary of the Navy during World War I and, and briefly in the Western Front where he accompanied a railroad gun crew over to the front, desperately wanting to get into action like Cousin Ted had done. Um, but from the time he was a, a, could read, he was really into military history and especially naval history. And when you visit Hyde Park, uh, on the walls are all these prints, many of them from the War of 1812, uh, because of the Navy was so big to him. George C. Marshall, who was the Army Chief of Staff, once commented to a colleague, he says, I really don't mind so much that he so obviously favors the Navy, but it does bother me when he refers to the Navy as us and the Army as them. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough. Uh, but other than that blind spot, I think Roosevelt wanted to include and involve whatever talent he could in his administration, both politically at home and militarily overseas. Yeah. I'm not sure forgiveness was his strong suit. I think he held political grudges. I mean, Al Smith is a classic one, although the feeling was mutual. Lincoln famously wrote, vented his disappointment without transmitting it. Mm. After the Battle of Gettysburg, he wrote a letter to General Meade, who had won the battle, but had elected not to chase General Lee back to the Potomac River. Um, because it was so hot, there was so, many, so much death, so much destruction, so many wounded, whatever the reason. Um, and Lincoln wrote a really pointed letter saying, I'm immeasurably disappointed. The war will now be extended. Um, I can't express my disappointment strongly enough. And then he wrote at the bottom, to General Meade, never signed, never sent. It's a good thing to remember when we email today. You can write it, but don't. Don't always send. And, and well, not, there, there is an FDR equivalent to that. I think it, yeah. in his treatment of uh, Douglas MacArthur, 
Uh, Franklin Roosevelt thought Douglas MacArthur was, Roosevelt's words, the most dangerous man in America. I mean, Huey Long was another one, but, but Mac MacArthur was too because he was fundamentally not a Democrat small d. I don't think he really believed in the rule of the people. He believed in rule of those with the, the greatest brain, which was obviously his own. Uh, and, and, and frankly, MacArthur was insubordinate, not just to Harry Truman during the Korean War, but he was insubordinate to Franklin Roosevelt during the Second World War. Uh, he was a thorn in Roosevelt's side all the time. He conducted, quite frankly, a terrible campaign in the Philippines from December of 1941 until he was ordered to depart uh, Corregidor four months later. And of course, eventually, the garrison there had to surrender. Uh, and what, how did Roosevelt handle this? He gave him the Medal of Honor and command of the Southwest Pacific. Now, that wasn't quite forgiveness, but it was recognition of the fact that we're in a dark time, and we need a hero, and this guy looks good in the movies. And Americans admire him, and I'm not going to take that away from them. And he left Douglas MacArthur in command, though when a decision had to be made, as to whether MacArthur would command the main route to Japan or whether the Navy would command the main route to Japan in the Central Pacific Drive, the one that ended up finally Iwo Jima and Okinawa, Roosevelt chose the Navy. MacArthur never forgave him for that. So that, that tension was always there, but, but Roosevelt let it, let it go. That's a, that's a really good example. I think we'll do two more questions between us and then ask if you have questions. I, I did want to get to, um, to one point that I'm really interested in, and it's a subtle one that's hard to pin down with precision. I think each of these leaders evolved significantly. The Lincoln of, who gave the second inaugural address about malice toward none and also about the war that would continue until every drop of blood drawn with a lash was repaid by one drawn with a sword that it was God's will, was not the same man who, who promised to enforce the Fugitive Slave Act if it could reverse secession in just four years before in the first inaugural. The man who fought for the 13th Amendment with everything at his disposal, including jobs for people who were losing their federal jobs, was not the same man who said that he, would, he was fighting principally to fight for the Union. Was there evolution? in Lincoln. I say yes, although the, my, current historiography is Lincoln was always anti-slavery. He just needed to find the opportunity. I'm still an evolutionist on, on Lincoln. What about Roosevelt? And, and certainly well, let, me, let me answer your Lincoln answer question Lincoln first. Question. I always tell my students, when you take a multiple choice test, if you're in doubt, the answer is always all of the above. <laughs> and, and I right. think he did evolve. But I also think that Lincoln was serious when he said, if slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. And I have always believed that since I was a very young man and first encountered the institution, it's fundamentally inhuman, it's certainly un-American, and wrong. And he would do what he could to kill it within the bounds of the Constitution. He wouldn't be garrison and burn the Constitution as a pact with the devil. He wouldn't be a revolutionist who would overthrow the government, but he would do all that he could as far as he could go within the parameters of what the public would tolerate to get that. So I think, and I think part of that evolution was figuring out where that was and how to push that envelope a little further. So let me answer that before we do okay. FDR. I, I absolutely agree that he was committed to placing slavery, as he put it, on the course of ultimate extinction by strangling it. How that was going to happen, I'm not sure, but yeah. it was about no, creating right. a supermajority in you're Congress right. Right. that could pass a, a and, and the timeline on that could be huge. 1900 is yeah, what he yeah, guessed yeah. at one point no, that's true. in 1862. Where I think he changed is on the powers of a central government to effect change, yeah. on, on issuing a military proclamation, on pushing an amendment, on you know, inhibiting yeah. a pushback from the no, press that's, that's and speech. True. You're right. That's a good. I'm drafting, so I think that's where his fundamental change is. I so agree. Let, let's. Was on it, FDR? He was pretty big on federal power from the first day, right? Yeah, I think so. I think he saw government as an inst as a, as an instrument to make lives better for the American people. Now, of course, I don't want to get into the argument of whether government's the problem or the solution, but I think Roosevelt certainly believed that 
government could be an effective tool, particularly in a depression, particularly in a time of world war, when we all need to be pulling on the same rope and hopefully in the same direction. So he was, I think, pretty much committed to that. And like Lincoln, how far can I go with this? You know, what's, what will Congress allow me? What will the Supreme Court tolerate? And of course, when the Supreme Court said, that's it, the, what is it, the NIRA, the NRA? NRA. That you can't do. Well, then we'll change the Supreme Court. And then he found out how far he could go, because he couldn't go that far. Could not go that far. That's why I went, okay, and backed away from that. But, but I think in the same way, uh, he, was, he was willing to, to stretch the outer boundaries of that envelope to do as much as he possibly could. First, to win the war against the economic depression, and then second, to win the war against the Axis. You know what I think both men also had in terms of evolving? They both seemed to wear the the suffering of the people on their faces. Yeah. They both lost weight. Just looking at those pictures, you can't see them, maybe they're on the podium there. I was gonna suggest those, you see those, see those guys? They're 20 years younger in those photographs than I am now. I've lived a pretty easy life. I noticed you didn't say they're 20 years younger than I, uh, than I well, am. Well, I'm older than you are. But let's, let's not go. All right, then we are. <laughs> They're younger than we are in those yeah. pictures. The presidency wears you out. By the way, we intentionally chose these pictures. Of th these are both men at the end of their lives. Yeah. Lincoln is 56. Roosevelt is, what, 62 or 3 here? Yeah. 56 years old. <laughs> Lincoln had lost 30 pounds in the presidency and aged. And Roosevelt, of course, had serious cardiovascular yeah, had disease and high blood pressure. Issues. But both of I think people identified with that and, and felt they weren't living high um, life while other people were suffering. I got nothing to say to that. I think we should end at Hildeen. It's appropriate to do our last exchange on presidential families, hmm. on how important they are, or maybe they're overrated as an important part of sustaining a leader, whether it's a supportive husband or a supportive wife. I mean, Mary Lincoln had deep problems and was not, was helpful as an advisor through most of Lincoln's life, but in the end was not able to help. Eleanor was, of course, crucially important once Roosevelt lost the use of his legs and was a treasured advisor, but someone who Roosevelt also pushed away in the last years of his, last months of his life, for sure, because she had become rather radicalized and, and he was not and, and he was becoming increasingly annoyed. And then we should talk about their children as well. Okay, quickly on Mary Lincoln. I, I'm more in the uh, Gene Baker school of Mary Lincoln than, than the, what, the Jason Emerson school, I guess. I, I think Lincoln and Mary, uh, Abraham Lincoln and Mary Lincoln uh, were desperately in love with one another and what, what bonded them together was that they could exchange intellectual ideas. Uh, one to one, even up, you know. Uh, they would argue, and, and, and they were both smart. But of course, in the 19th century, being a smart woman <laughs> doesn't get you very far. I'm not sure it still does, but and that's another <laughs> argument we can have later. Um, so I think their, their political exchange meant everything to them. Now, Mary, you know, in her later life, had difficulties. No questions about it. But she saw two children die in the White House and saw her husband's brain splattered over her dress in front of her face. I mean, if she was a little unhinged, I, I would be too. Um, so, so I think she was more of a, of a helpmate, more of a strong woman. And I think the people who hated her, like Lincoln's first biographer, Billy Herndon, who was, I think, jealous of her and her influence, uh, were un unnerved by a smart, capable woman. Before we get to Eleanor, let me, let me respond. respond. I don't, because I don't want anyone to think that I'm in the Michael Burlingame school <laughs> of hating Mary and thinking that she was the most evil and corrupting influence in the history of Washington. I think she was on an arc of dissent. When mm -hmm. Willie died in 1862, I think she was becoming more and more ill. I mean, it's, it, it, it always astonishes me that when Betty Ford became ill and suffered problems of addiction, she became a national heroine. And when Mary Lincoln became ill, there was no tolerance right. for that, and she became reviled. She was also, she suffered from being a southerner, 
in, in, yes. in, and was accused by her enemies and Lincoln's enemies of harboring sympathies, which she certainly did not. No one was ever more supportive of Lincoln than she was. She, but she arrived in Washington believing, at long last, he's not going to leave for the office in the morning anymore and be out of my sphere. He's going to be working in the House. Mm -hmm. But she never entered his office. It just wasn't done. She never entered the office of the president. And there was a division, and she became less of an influence. You know, Doris, who you mentioned before, Doris Goodwin was originally going to write her book about Abraham and Mary Lincoln, yeah. because she had written a book about Franklin and Eleanor, of course, which was a huge bestseller and a, won the Pulitzer Prize, I think. But she found that there was no dramatic arc as we like to say to the story, because rather than becoming closer and closer and more and more important to each other, they in fact separated because she was not prepared to cope yeah. at that point, or yeah. not able no, that, to that's cope. That's true. But I, um, I agree. I don't think that we're, we would know Abraham Lincoln if he hadn't married Mary Todd. That's quite possible. So let's, let's, let's finish with Eleanor. Franklin and Eleanor? Yeah, we got 30 seconds. We can wrap that one up. <laughs> I think that was a love match early on. If you see the photographs of them when they're in their 20s, she was a beautiful young woman uh, and smart. And I think that's the thing, like the Lincolns, that, that attracted them both. A smart woman. Wow, this is so cool. I can have really good conversations with this really smart woman. Now, of course, what happened in the case of the Roosevelts is that Franklin fell in love with Lucy Mercer, who was her social secretary. And I think he stayed in love with Lucy Mercer, even after she married Mr. Rutherford, whose first name I can't remember, uh, and became Lucy, Ru Lucy Mercer Rutherford. And Eleanor agreed with uh, inter Sarah, the mother, mother-in-law in Eleanor's case, it could broker the agreement. Eleanor would stay with, with uh, Franklin, but he must never see Lucy Mercer again. But he did. Well, he didn't for a while. He didn't, he picked it up again in the, the war. The day he died. She was there. She was in the room. I know, and I, and I think that was a shadow that lay over the rest of their relationship. They continued to be smart. They continued to exchange. I think he took very seriously her advice. She had her finger on the pulse of people in a way that even Franklin Roosevelt did not, and he benefited greatly from that. So they were, remained a great team, but they were not lovers after that. But a remarkable partnership in which her influence became so strong. I mean. I think Roosevelt liked her not only because she was a pretty young woman, she was astonishingly shy yeah, from everything true. I've learned. I mean, she could barely utter, I mean, she was smart to be sure she was educated. You know who sort of got her into an, a, a mode of learning and becoming more active? Her mother-in-law, who gets such a terrible <laughs> rap, introduced her to settlement houses on the Lower East Side, to African-American leaders who frequented her parlor, to activism, to the suffrage movement, and suddenly Eleanor okay. was off to the sure. races. Sure, you know, Harold works in a building, and <laughs> supervises a building that Sarah purchased for the young couple she as built. a wedding she present. She built, built for them. Two brownstones side by side with connecting doors. <laughs> one for Franklin Eleanor, one for Sarah. Not, we, we no call thanks. It, we call it the first new deal. <laughs> <laughs> So with that, we'd love to, how are the questions going to run? Seth, are you going to, thank you all very much. <laughs>
and dealt with in a more modern era. And, and of course, this is still an argument. Uh, the whole question of originalism, do we have to accept what James Madison intended when he wrote that sentence, or do we say, we get the gist of it, James, and, and we're going to try to apply that to the internet uh, in, in reasonable intellectual ways. And I think that's the group that Roosevelt fell into. So it wasn't that he despised the Constitution. It did create an impediment for him for some things that he wanted to get done. But I think he believed that it could either be amended or that it could be interpreted in such a way without violating the spirit of the instrument to get things done in an era for which it wasn't really written. And I'll let Harold. Well, I, I will just put in my two cents about Abraham Lincoln. Um, there was no way around the constitutional protection of slavery. It was enshrined, without mentioning the word slavery, in the Constitution. And the amendment process was specifically outlined in, in the Constitution. But Lincoln had flexibility in his heart and in his philosophy from the beginning. He often talked about the, um, the, uh, the fact that the Declaration and the Constitution were at odds uh, uh, as founding documents. And the way he answered the question to his own satisfaction was that the Declaration was an apple of gold and the Constitution was a frame of silver, picking up from the Bible, that both had to coexist. When it was in his interest to talk about, and his political interest, all to the good, to talk about the Declaration being the principal founding document, four score and seven years ago refers not to the Constitution, but to the Declaration, then he stressed that. When it was in his interest to say, I have the power to do the following, and I need congressional help to do something else, the Constitution became preeminent. The Civil War was all about constitutionality. I, I have a, will have a solemn oath registered in heaven to preserve and protect, to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. People can be divorced, but states cannot be divorced. I will come after you and force you back into the Union. But when he was talking about the evils of slavery, he was talking about the intent of the founders. Both men were extraordinarily flexible. I think that, that's the heart of it. So I think the difference between them is, is less than, than you, yeah. your question suggests. This gentleman. This is Mr. my understanding you worked with Steven Spielberg on the script and Link. Was there something about that performance by Daniel Day-Lewis that you saw that just knocked your socks off that maybe we wouldn't pick up ourselves? OK, so the question for me was, um, what about Daniel Day-Lewis's performance um, knocked my socks off? There's something I, I don't think there was anything that I saw that you all didn't see. I think you know, his extraordinary attention to detail was astonishing. He was so attentive to detail that my reward as a script consultant, which was that I would be permitted on the set to visit and consult, was aborted because he said, I don't want any diversions. I don't want any distractions. I don't want any modern people. I don't want any New York people. I just want people around who will call me Mr. President and, and not interfere. So that's one part that you didn't see, the fact that I was really ticked off that I didn't get <laughs> to go to Richmond. Here's one part that I think we all can appreciate. And I don't know if you know uh, the, the details of the performance, probably not. Um, so on the opening day of the shoot, if you remember the movie well, there is a moment when Lincoln is talking to his cabinet and explaining why he thinks he has the power and had the power to emancipate enslaved people and why that was justifiable in terms of war and why judgments will still be passed and why he's worried about the Supreme Court when it rules after the war and how he has to protect freed people after the war. And there were those who say this and there were those who say what and that. And now I believe I have the power. And he slammed the table and said and his, glass, his spectacles jumped up in the air and came down. That was all one take on the first day. That's how brilliant he is. Now they filmed close ups after that and inserted them. But he memorized and recited that in a voice that Steven Spielberg had only heard on a tape recording that he had made to tell the director, this is the voice I've chosen. 
And, and Daniel Day-Lewis was so brilliant at this, is so inept as, in technical things that he couldn't get the cassette out of the tape recorder. <laughs> so he took, shipped the entire tape recorder to, to Steven Spielberg. So those are just two little, three backstories, including my own resentment. So now you have a question from Professor, Professor Simons. Simons. I read this one historical thing a couple years ago. I've tried to find it out about Roosevelt. I've never been able to find it out. And my brother here, who is a Florida Gator. Me too. Told, I know. I know. Told me you would know the answer. We'll find out. I read that Winston Churchill, after Roosevelt's death, and after Churchill had left office, had said, said some rather disparaging things about Franklin. Have you ever, ever heard anything like that? I have, repeat, actually. Repeat the, question. Uh, the question concerns uh, Churchill's uh, view of Franklin Roosevelt, that <coughs> someone had suggested that well after Roosevelt had died and Churchill had left office as prime minister, that he said something disparaging about Roosevelt. Um, yes, I have seen that. I don't know whether to credit it or not. Because I think what Winston Churchill believed was that Roosevelt was the one essential person in the Allied alliance to hold it all together. Uh, he wept when Roosevelt died. When, when they were together in North Africa, he helped carry him up to the top of a tower for the view that he could see of the Atlas Mountains. Uh, and, and after he left uh, to go back to the United States, Churchill remained in North Africa for a while, had some health issues, and stayed to recuperate and said, uh, if that man ever dies, we are all lost. So I think he fully appreciated the role that Franklin Roosevelt played in holding together the Allied coalition. Remember, Joseph Stalin and Winston Churchill together are oil and water, or whatever analogy you want to use. And without Roosevelt there to be the person who could jolly one person and charm another and agree and compromise and, and bring people into the circle, uh, that alliance, which was never truly an alliance, uh, might not have worked at all. And I think Churchill knew that. Now, at the same time, there was a general attitude about Americans that the Americans are, don't really pull their own weight. Uh, and this was a view most British generals and many British admirals had as well. Uh, because the Britain had been in this war for years before we ever got involved, and then we came in and automatic immediately wanted to take charge of it. Well, you can imagine how that played with people who had lost two brothers and a cousin already in the war. Uh, so I think some of that uh, may have contributed to this suggestion that Roosevelt occasionally had some resentment of Franklin Roosevelt. But I think. It's, it's the exception that proves the rule. I think, by and large, Churchill was greatly admiring of Franklin Roosevelt. I think uh, Joseph Lillyveld, in his book about Roosevelt's last year, does make the point that um, Churchill was unhappy at Yalta, their last interaction, yeah, because he felt that Roosevelt was playing too heavily to Stalin, and Roosevelt was, and, and Churchill was beginning to worry about the empire, worrying about the post-war support. Not beginning to worry. Churchill had been worried about the empire from right. the very beginning of the But worrying war, about but, American support after But you war. know, Franklin Roosevelt went to Churchill before that at Yalta and said, forgive me for what I'm going to do yeah. here. I think this is going to be necessary. And he belittled Churchill in front of Stalin, got Stalin laughing, <laughs> making fun of Churchill. What good laughter that is. Um, doesn't mean he liked it. Doesn't mean he liked it. But yeah. But, yeah. but I think that was a, a point. But I, I agree with you that he mourned. Go Gators. He mourned, <laughs> he mourned deeply. In the back. Yeah, the question is whether Roosevelt also had problems with Robert Moses, you know, um, who was the great um, builder of New York, the power broker about whom Robert Caro has written uh, and is responsible for many lasting building projects in New York. You know, Moses was of a personality that was similar to MacArthur's. He was very aloof. He was very authoritarian. But they did work in concert on, on um, works progress administration and public works administration projects. Um, right now, Roosevelt House has an exhibit on the impact of the New Deal in New York City. And those of you who are familiar with New York will know LaGuardia Airport I hate even to mention it, it's such a mess right now. The FDR Drive, murals in post offices, Bryant Park, uh, 
Jones Beach, swimming pools in low-income projects. That is credited quite often to Robert Moses, but in fact, it was Roosevelt money that was doing it, filtered through LaGuardia and then Robert Moses as the great builder. The question concerns uh, uh, Japanese Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, who was commander of the combined fleet in Japan, uh, and that he had said prior to the war that he didn't want to go to war, but if they did, they would have to attack and defeat Pearl Harbor. There are uh, nuggets of truth in that, but it, it, the, play, the context is a little bit different. Uh, Yamamoto had actually spent uh, several tours in the United States uh, had gone to Harvard University for to take not for a degree, but to take several courses. He had toured the United States extensively and went back and told the Japanese Admiralty that we cannot defeat the United States in a war. I've seen the spindle top oil fields in East Texas. I've seen Henry Ford's car manufacturing industries. We cannot defeat the United States in a war. And the army, which was ruling Japan in the late 1930s, bogged down as they were in China, were determined to get the resources they needed to fight the war in China from uh, the British and Dutch uh, colonies in South Asia. And the Philippines were in the way, so the Philippines had to go, so the Americans had to be defeated, so we're going to do it. And that's when Yamamoto said, well, if we're going to do this, and I am Japanese, and I think this is a dumb decision, but if we're going to do this, the only shot you've got is to take out the American fleet not Pearl Harbor, but to take out the American fleet on the first day of the war. That will buy us six months to conquer that resource base in the South Pacific and then to create a defensive barrier and hope that the Americans wear themselves out trying to take it back. It's the only shot we've got. It's a long shot, but if you're going to do this, this is the only way that I will agree to remain, I will resign unless you adopt this policy. All right, mm -hmm. fine, we'll do it. And that's how Pearl Harbor, the Japanese made the decision to attack Pearl Harbor. So yes, it was on Yamamoto, and it was because he opposed the war initially, but believed this was the only chance they had to achieve the objective that the army generals insisted was necessary. The question is, how important is a role does serendipity play in giving leaders the opportunity to, to, to shine? Of course. Look at the classic case of Theodore Roosevelt, who hungered for uh, a conflict or a single event that would ensure his immortality, and instead just was such a bundle of energy and created programs to, to break trusts and whatever he did, but always regretted that a moment had not arisen to test him in the public spotlight. Of course, there are arguments to be made that every civil war battle is, is based, the, the outcome could have been changed by a, a contingent moment that just altered slightly, including Gettysburg. So obviously uh, serendipity plays an enormous role. Um, both, both men again faced existential crises that they had to deal with. And how lucky is it that America has been blessed with leaders like that at moments when we've needed the most. It's and, just extraordinary. And let me respond to David's uh, reference to Wendell Wilkie, too. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting, Wendell Wilkie what became, to almost everyone's surprise, and even his own, perhaps, uh, the Republican nominee. Uh, and what was expected of him as a Republican candidate was that he would attack the New Deal. This is terrible. This is an American. We've got to get rid of this New Deal. This Social Security stuff, all this is wrong. Get it out of here. And also, isolationism. Stop trying to stop the Germans. I mean, stop cozying up to the British. Stop with all the help that you're giving to the British. It's going to get us into trouble overseas. We want to stay out of that horrible war and maintain our own separateness. And Wilkie would do only one of those. He, he attacked the New Deal uh, relentlessly. But he said, no, no, uh, in terms of Hitler's Germany, the president is right. We've got to stand with Britain. We've got to give them all the support we can. We've got to prepare for war, because whether we want it or not, it may come our way anyway. And that view gave Roosevelt cover. I mean, that allowed him to get through. Lend-Lease passed by one vote. And absent Lend-Lease, it's arguable, whoever, who knows if you, what counterfactual hypotheses you can deal with, but it is conceivable that Britain doesn't survive until 1941 when Hitler stupidly invades Russia and then the Japanese attack the United States and change the dynamic of the war entirely. If Britain falls, there's no place from which the United States can invade 
a Nazi-dominated Europe other than the East Coast of the United States. And it could be argued that Wendell Wilkie's support for Roosevelt's foreign policy, even as he was running against him as a Republican candidate, helped Roosevelt maintain that pro-British policy. So let me end with one Lincoln quote that may sum up. Oh, sure. Well, we may sum up this question. Abraham Lincoln wrote late in the war to a newspaper editor. And I've always wondered whether he really believed what he was saying himself or whether, or whether he was being modest for effect. He said, I do not claim to have controlled events, mm. but that events have controlled me. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, that's true of any presidency and any president. Seth. I have one final question for you, and that's to get back to what we talked about a little bit at the beginning. And that is for each of you to comment a little bit about both Lincoln and Roosevelt's the character their character and the value set that allowed them to be the great wartime leaders that they ended up being. I mean, Lincoln, something deep within yeah. them. That's what I want to get. Yeah. What Lincoln had at, at his core was a deep and abiding honesty. He wasn't called Honest Abe as a campaign slogan or as a trick. He was renowned for being dependable and believable from the time he was a child and from the time he was a young man, chosen always to be the judge in tugs of war and wrestling matches. Um, his, he was exemplary because he not only was able to rhetoricize the values of the American dream, but to live it. He wasn't just espousing a political faith. He was living the dream that any person of the most humble origins could rise from the most modest circumstances uh, to leadership. That was what made America unique. That was his idea of American exceptionalism worth fighting for. Um, as he told soldiers in the middle of the war, many of you have fought bravely and have still wondered what it is we're sacrificing so much for. And he looked at them and said, it is the chance that any one of your sons can come and live in this big house as my father's son has. And certainly, just in terms of raw character, the ability to dig deep within himself, to sacrifice his own health and well-being and time with his family and friends, to devote himself to 18, 19-hour days, and to pull from within himself the sacrifice that he was demanding of other people. I'll leave Roosevelt okay. to you. That's good. I like that. Thank you. Um, I think both men were very ambitious. Uh, and I think ambition drove them to seek high office to begin with. But to be successful, to be the kind of president they became, they also had to have empathy. And Lincoln got his in an early dose. He was of the mudsill class. He came out of that. He knew. He struggled. When Franklin Roosevelt was a young man, he was rather flippant about life. Things were easy for him. He was tall, he was handsome, he was good looking, he was smart, he was rich. He didn't hardly have to work at all. And what gave him the empathy that, that bred the temperament that made him a great president were two things, Eleanor and polio. Absent polio, I don't know that he could have internalized in quite the same way the difficulties that life can create for people who don't have it all handed to them on a silver platter. And absent that empathy, he would not have been a great president, maybe he wouldn't have been president at all. Uh, so I think that, and, and Eleanor's constant prodding and reminding of that there are other people worse off than you are, and even more who are worse off than they are, and we need to remember them all the time, and that our policies and our positions and our politics have to keep those people in mind. Uh, Lincoln had it from a very early age. Roosevelt absorbed it and learned it in the process of growing to be an adult. Um, so I, I don't want to say good for polio, but it, it certainly helped make him uh, the president that he became. The question was, who since Roosevelt has shown that, that kind of empathy? That's a great question. I think a number of presidents since Roosevelt have shown elements of it. I think Harry Truman had some of it. I think Dwight Eisenhower 
had some of it, but maybe not in the same directions. And, and I, I think uh, Bill Clinton did as well. Uh, I may be revealing my politics here. I think uh, Barack Obama tried very hard within that very narrow, and in his case, particularly narrow parameter of what was politically possible to bring, uh, make life better for more Americans that had been left out of the great American dream. Let me, I'll throw in the years 1961 to 65. Uh, Kennedy, in terms of his ability to inspire young people, and uh, he inspired me. I was 11 years old when he ran for president, and it was the first election I was ever really interested in. And it was transformative for many young people, just to hear the voice, and in that he shared with Roosevelt the, the communications ability. And Lyndon Johnson, who just could not communicate, and yet, for his, despite his upbringing, despite his, his uh, Dixiecrat origins, despite his early votes against integration became the greatest civil rights president in American That's history. That's true. That's true. I know. Forgive me for not mentioning LBJ. No, I'm glad you did because I yeah. got to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. We're done. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Thank you, Harold. Thank you, Chris. Thank you.